Okay, I can see everyone is joining the webinar now. So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special session on practical practice management. My name is Grant Chapman, and I work in the advisor marketing team here at Intuit QuickBooks, and I'm your host for today's session. It's really great to have everyone join today. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, where I'm here in Sydney, uh, and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. In today's webinar, we're going to take a look at some of the tools uh, that can drive productivity in how you manage your practice, your team, uh, your workflows, and automation. Uh, it's likely everyone on the call today is aware of Intuit's flagship product, QuickBooks Online, given that it's used by more than 300,000 accountants and bookkeepers and more than 7 million small businesses all around the world. Uh, importantly, it also includes a number of features that only accountants and bookkeepers can access to help you really power through working with your clients. Uh, these are tools like books review and prep for taxes. Then there's our payroll solution integrated with QuickBooks Online that makes sure your clients' employees are getting paid on time uh, while making STP and ATO compliance simple. On the compliance front as well, we have QuickBooks Tax powered by Lodger, which is a really powerful online tool that helps you manage your tax and VAS preparation and lodgement needs. And one of the key features that makes QuickBooks Tax unique is the ability to import data from various accounting systems, not just from QuickBooks Online. So it actually works for all of your small business clients. Then we have the practice management solutions in QuickBooks Online Accountant, which help you manage your practice as well as your clients. And it helps you keep on top of your workflows, manage your projects and tasks, track your time and your billing, uh, and integrates with a host of other solutions and apps to make running your practice easier and more productive. Before we get started, let me just take you through some very quick housekeeping. So today's event is being recorded and we'll be providing everyone who registered with a copy by email. So watch out for an email in your inbox that will let you review any of the content we share today uh, and share it with your other team members. We do have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, please submit it through Slido uh, and we'll aim to answer as many questions as we can. You'll find that Slido box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen there. If you're having any technical difficulties with not being able to see or hear the presentation, uh, we'd suggest you refresh your browser, restart your device, or maybe try a different device. Uh, again, though, you will receive a copy of the recording. So while it's not as good as the live thing, there's no need to panic that you'll miss out. Uh, you can also navigate to a troubleshooting guide that's located at the bottom of your page there, and that contains a link to an alternate video, uh, video browser. With the housekeeping out of the way, let's jump into today's session. Today, you're going to hear from Tish Bagwandeen. Tish is the founder and director of InFinance Solutions. And with more than 12 years of financial experience, Tish has an in-depth understanding of business from managing and growing startup enterprises to taking care of the daily financial requirements of companies. As a chartered accountant, Tish has global experience that span, uh, spans a variety of industries, having previously worked in the United States and South Africa. After working as a financial auditor, she transitioned her career towards that of a group financial controller in the financial services sector. And after successfully transitioning the company to sale on the ASX, she co-founded it in Finance Solutions. Tish is all about the numbers and loves working with people and small companies to help them achieve their business goals. And she's also a member of the QuickBooks Trainer Rider Network. Today, Tish is going to look at some of the tools available to you in QuickBooks Online Accountant that you can use to manage your practice and your projects. We also have Ethan Cooney, the Senior Partnerships Manager at Ignition, joining us. Ethan was the winner of the 2021 Accountants Daily 30 Under 30 Tech Innovator Award, and he brings more than eight years of experience working with accounting and bookkeeping practices within several high growth technology businesses. Ethan has consulted with hundreds of accounting professionals, professional associations, regulators, and thought leaders to devise partnerships that now benefit thousands of practices all around the world. And he has in-depth knowledge of practice workflows and is passionate about helping firms operate efficiently uh, and to provide high quality client experiences. Glenn Castle, regional accounting and product expert with Dex Australia is here too. And Glenn is a chartered accountant who's combined his love of technology with his accounting skill set. He's passionate about the use of tax and accounting software to drive efficiency within the industry. And he's always looking for new and exciting uh, tools and tech to make life easier. He has more than 20 years experience split between working in practice, implementing software, and as a product manager. And last but not least, we have Chris McDonald, who's the Vice President of Growth with CloudStaff. CloudStaff is an AFR Fast 100 company and a market-leading Australian outsourcing business. For more than 15 years, Chris has been partnering with business, business, excuse me, businesses uh, to hire, build, and scale world-class teams all around the globe. Based in Sydney, Chris and his team work hand in hand with businesses who are seeking to hire outsourced accounting and bookkeeping talent to ensure the best outcomes for their business. All right, let's get into it. Today's agenda, 
Today, I'm going to kick off by bringing our presenters on for a quick introduction and to really set the scene for what we're going to cover and how each solution we're going to talk about plays a key part in the practice management puzzle. Then I'm going to share uh, some tips to help you take your approach to practice management to the next level. Tish will then jump in to cover those tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant and how it can serve as the heart of your practice management solution. And then Ethan, Glenn, and Chris will take you through the tools and integrations with QuickBooks Online in Ignition and Dext, uh, and how cloud staff can solve one of the key issues for many firms right now, which is finding someone to do all the work that we have on. So with that, let's bring our presenters on and we'll get into our panel session. Tish, I'll, I'll start with you. So as an advisor, can you touch on the importance of practice and workflow management for your firm and how you use it to manage your workload and track all the work that's flowing across your business? And that could be anything from bringing on a new client or monitoring jobs across the team through to getting paid. Thanks, Grant. Um, so for me, one of the important aspects within my business is as a small business owner, I think the biggest risk is the business becomes too reliant on us. So when I think about practice management and workflow management, it's really about how am I making business independent from me and then covering off on my vital risk. Um, so really it's about the different tech pieces that are available to me in the market that are gonna help me document literally what's in my head onto a workflow and then hand that off to my team. I think when we talk about workflows, uh, people are just generally inclined to think about client workflow. But when you are looking at workflows, I think it's even more important to look at what your internal processes are and start documenting that through your farm. Because essentially, really, you just want your business ticking along without you, that so you can free up more of your time to sort of focus on high level strategy. Great, thanks Tish. Um, what's, what's been one of your biggest aha moments or, or maybe even a bit of a, a watch out as you've kind of built out those tools and processes over the years, something that our audience should kind of keep in mind today as you walk them through the tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant and, and does our app partners do the same for their solutions? I think when you look at small practices, um, practice management build out actually comes out of necessity. Uh, most of the time we find ourselves in a situation where we actually need to start building this out very rapidly. Um, and we don't have enough time to take a pause and say, okay, let me map out my entire process and how I want each piece of technology interacting with each other. So my first piece of advice would be take a step back and actually map out what you want to achieve in the long term for your farm. And once you have a clear picture, then you can start going and saying, okay, this is the different pieces of technology that I'm going to connect into that workflow map. Um, the biggest learning for me, I would say, is when I started building out my workflows, I was inclined to want to document every single step that I was performing within a particular uh, project and have that in my workflow. And I found that that actually bogged me down quite a bit and I was taking an overall um, overly risk-based approach. Um, I then took a step back and said, well, actually, what are the high level pieces that I need to cover off in my workflow? So if I'm handing this off to a team, whether that team is sitting in Australia or remotely, everyone understands what the expectation is. And I found when I realigned my approach, it then became easier to build that out. And the third thing for me is integration. There's so much of technology that speaks to each other and integrates, um, but I think it's also important to take a step back and understand how each piece of technology integrates with each other, because that still needs to go back into that overall process map of how you want things to work within your own ecosystem. Great, thanks Tish. Uh, Ethan, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a little question. You know, Ignition obviously plays such a key part at the very start of the practice management process with proposals and engagements. And then again, right at the end as you're collecting payments. But what do you hear most often from advisors that you're working with when they're trying to improve their end-to-end -end approach to practice management? And why is it so important they get that first step right? Um, and look, everyone understands the importance of getting paid, but why is it also really important that advisors are automating their processes at that end as well? Yeah, thanks, Grant. That's a great question and ties on really closely to what Tish was just sharing with us. The biggest theme that we're seeing um, within our network of close to 7,000 uh, SME accounting practices, so quite a good sample size, is that visibility and control over work in progress and also capacity planning. It's been a major theme for us over the last sort of 18 months. Um, I think this is probably largely due to the resource constraints we're seeing in the market. Uh, not only with just the lack of staffing availability, uh, but also just the amount of client work that's coming through the door. 
I think the feedback we're getting is that client expectations have drastically increased. That, so they're expecting work turned around, you know, faster than ever. They're expecting um, more frequent communication with their advisors. And so really keeping tabs on all of that work that's in the pipeline, particularly if you have a team. I know that a lot of um, you know, directors, partners, and so on are wanting that visibility across who in our team is completing each of the tasks that are in our pipeline. So um, that's been a major thing that we've seen. Uh, and I think that's been a result of, yeah, a lot of a lot of urgent work with deadlines that are coming through. Um, a couple of other things that have stood out is you know, internal communication. So as Tish mentioned, internal workflows, how are you communicating with your team around the jobs to be done, the, the various tasks that need completion and who's doing what, um, and also trying to, I guess, limit that risk of, of um, pick up, put down. So team members sort of getting half started on a job, putting it down, you know, going back and forwards with the client. So really trying to make it easy and, and efficient uh, for your team to get that work completed. And the third thing I would say there um, in terms of what uh, has been standing out is just the cash flow management within a firm itself. So I think industry-wide debtor days for accounting firms in Australia is around 53 days, so almost two months. And we've we've seen a lot of firms try to implement a, a new approach um, to a structuring their fees um, to try and smooth out cash flow for their business, increasing their fees, and then also implementing better um, collections processes to try and bring down those receivables days and free up more cash flow, whether that's to give their staff pay increases um, to be competitive with some of the larger practices or to um, actually hire and, and recruit um, more resources to get that work done as well. So there's a fair bit there that I've, I've just mentioned. But um, yeah, in summary, I guess the key things that we're seeing is how do we control work that's coming into the funnel? How do we control all of those jobs to be done and, and tasks and due dates and all of that internal communication? And then how do we uh, make sure that we're managing that risk of um, completing work that's not billable or not recoverable uh, by putting in place better payment processes? So that would those would sort of be the main things that we're seeing, Grant, um, from our point of view. Brilliant. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Glenn, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, people obviously understand the importance of data to their firms having accurate client data, but beyond compliance, beyond saving time and not having to re-enter incorrect data, can you touch on why automating your data collection is so important and some of the other benefits it brings to a business? Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, also, thanks for having us on to this session as well. Um, like, just probably want to echo what Ethan sort of spoken about there as well. You know, the importance of actually having the data in, into the system, you know, it's critical for any businesses, you know, wanting to actually be able to make informed decisions off it. You know, th there's some stats that we'll have a look at a little bit later, you know, inside of decks. Like, we will actually sit there and monitor um, what is the difference between, you know, the, the date uh, invoice has been submitted, for instance, as opposed, as opposed to actually what the original invoice date was. So actually looking, okay, how do we make those real-time decisions based upon the data that we actually have into the system? So that's critically important to actually make sure the data where, I guess, generating our financial reports off is in real time, it is, is up to date. Um, if we come back to sort of some of your points that we're speaking about there around compliance, I think, well, I hope everyone on this call is um, well and truly versed on what the actual requirements you know, are in terms of the, the records they require to keep um, in their businesses. And it's, you know, one thing I'd sort of say to, you know, all my friends out there that are, that are in business as well, you know, if they're going on the weekend, they want to take their four-wheel drive up to the beach, they want to ensure that they've basically got all the recovery gear. Um, they want to make sure that they're prepared. They're not going to go up to the beach without that information. You need to apply the same to your business. You know, we know that we need to capture invoices. We know we need to capture receipts. In the event that you do have to produce it down the track, you want to make sure that it is there and it is accessible um, to recover it because, you know, we don't necessarily have to, um, I guess, store it electronically, but it's going to be a lot easier, a lot more efficient. Um, why do we want to, I guess, automate the data collection? I think it's, it's pretty simple We because we can. You know, the tools and technology are there for us to now be able to do this. You know, I see a lot of people out there that we speak to and they say, hey, I can enter a bill or I can enter an invoice quicker than, you know, what the system will do it. Just what else could you be doing with that time? It's that lost opportunity cost, you know, as part of it. You know, the, the days of manually entering things like that or cash coding, um, they're inefficient. You know, there, there's smarter ways. We need to be embracing the tech um, to actually automate that process. And it is about getting into the habit of doing it, you know, getting out of the, the car, 
taking the photo of the receipt, you know, if you've gone and bought a coffee or whatever it is as well, it's just that habitual behaviour that's actually going to, I guess, drive, um, you know, the processes around how we can actually get data into the system in a timely manner. Awesome, thanks, Chris. So, Glenn, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll bring you on. Uh, Chris, the, the outsourced model is fairly well established, and I, I'd imagine, though, that with the continuing labour and skill shortage that's wreaking havoc, basically, with the Australian accounting uh, and bookkeeping firms, more and more firms are looking at this model, though, and I assume that if you are working with an outsourced or offshore team, your practice management tools are even more important so that you can keep track of the jobs that are flowing across the business. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing with the advisors that you work with and why practice management and, and workflow management is so critical when you are using an outsourced model? Yeah, sure, Grant. And firstly, thanks for inviting us here as well. Um, touching on, on your first point, I mean, the outsourcing model is... Um, it is quite mature these days, um, but it's also growing incredibly fast as well. You talked about labour shortage first and foremost. Clearly, you know, when we speak to um, firms of all sizes, from, from small practices even through to large um, talent, and the, and the availability of talent um, is, is incredibly uh, difficult right now, specifically in this sector as well. So that certainly has um, created some tailwinds in the outsourcing um, industry. Of course, the tools that are being used uh, are incredibly important, and it's kind of in the name, right? Cloud stuff. Uh, we've been around now for you know well over a decade, um, and we recognise that technology is an enabler um, for our customers to be hyper successful. So, um, to your point about practices um, using technology um, to to be effective. Um, it's not just about the tasks that they're doing, and they would certainly be using platforms to, to conduct their day-to-day -day tasks. It's beyond that now. It's about the communication tools that they're using as well. Um, it's, it's training and development. All of these facets that make you know, outsourced teams successful are reliant on technology. So really what we see is that when firms outsource and outsource successfully, it's really a marriage of brilliant talent combined with the technology that's what makes things really successful and that's where the outcomes are. Great, thanks, Glenn. We'll, Chris. Uh, sorry, Chris, uh, too many people on the call today. <laughs> we need bigger name tags. Uh, so today we're, we're gonna uh, run through some of the uh, key tools and the integrations with the QuickBooks suite that uh, help you run a more productive practice and manage your workflows. And hopefully we'll give you some solutions for, for the key issues that we've just spoken about. Now, even if you've built a really solid workflow last year, uh, what's changed in your team since? Have you got new team members? Have you got some empty seats? Have you got new tools? It's, it's likely there's been more change than you actually think. So now is really the ideal time to look at your team, at their workflows, their processes and tools, and to make sure that they'll all be ready when, when crunch time really hits. And a financial year is naturally a time when you're seeing a lot of new clients come in the door. So you want to make sure that you have a really robust engagements and onboarding process in place. You're also getting a lot of client data in, so you want to make sure that you're processing it with as light a lift as possible. Uh, and that the data is right the first time, so you're not wasting time on data re-entry. Uh, and that nothing's falling through the cracks. You need to be delegating across your team effectively, again, making sure nothing's falling through the cracks and that you're identifying the bottlenecks in your business in real time. And related to that, as, as Chris was saying, we are still in the midst of that skills crunch. It's really difficult to find good staff at the moment. It has been for a while. CPA uh, Australia recently wrote about how staff shortages in the accounting profession is forcing mergers amongst smaller firms and some firms are even just quitting the industry altogether. Uh, we're also seeing the big end of town uh, outbid smaller firms for talent. So you want to make sure that you're doing the most with what you have, as well as looking at new ways of working that uh, cloud solutions enable. Right, so everyone knows that moving your workflow and processes to the cloud improve your client experience, but it exponentially improves your team productivity as well. And it improves your firm's overall efficiency and usually your profitability as well. Standardizing your processes across your practice really is the most effective way of reducing errors and oversights. If everyone has their own way of doing things, there's naturally going to be some gaps. And when processes and responsibilities are standardized, clear and transparent, it actually increases accountability across your team. So as you start to build out a more proactive approach to workload planning across your practice, what's critical is that you're looking at both your client work uh, as well as the everyday work that's going into running your firm. So an approach to practice management that automates client processes delivers consistency of experience for your clients, but one that also accounts for the work that goes into running your firm day to day, that's where you're going to see those real productivity gains.
So if implementing a centralized integrated practice management approach can have such huge impacts on your firm's growth, on your revenue and profitability, why doesn't every firm implement one? Often they're overthinking it and they're just never getting around to getting started. There's a ton of opportunities in your firm right now, but this can actually make the implementation process seem overwhelming because you just don't know where to start. Uh, and even if you do know, you're not sure how to do it efficiently. You think there'll be a long process that's going to take weeks or months to execute, and that just makes you delay the process or never, never ever get around to it. The other key reason is that the team doesn't adopt the new processes and technology. So even if you find a way to implement technology and automation in your firm, there's no guarantee that your team's going to adopt it. Change is hard and many employees will push back on change, and that's what's going to result in a failed implementation. So it's important to get buy-in in the early stages when you're designing your workflows and choosing your tools. So how do you successfully implement these solutions across your firm? Focus on implementing one thing at a time. It's easy to get excited and try and implement everything all at once, but this can be a mistake because implementing solution and changing the way your team does things, it can be overwhelming. So if you try and throw several things at a team, new processes to learn all at once, it can be a bit overwhelming and cause them to reject things. You wanna focus on implementing one thing at a time. It'll break down the implementation process into bite-sized pieces that your team can easily digest. Starting small is a good idea as well. Change is hard. Even if you do break things down into bite-sized pieces, it can be difficult for the less tech savvy people on your team to accept. By focusing on the smaller and easier to implement solutions first, you can have a higher chance of success in the beginning. Your team will realize the value of automation. They'll feel more comfortable. Uh, and they're more likely to adopt the process. You'll also be able to use this momentum and the time it creates, the time it saves, the bandwidth it creates to successfully implement bigger and more complex automations down the road. So start small, but don't stop there, be consistent. If you're gonna automate just one process that's taking you two hours a week, that's gonna save you eight hours every month and 106 hours every year. That's an additional day every month. That's an additional three weeks every year that you've got up your sleeve. So just imagine how much time you're gonna save if you take that a consistent approach and manually uh, automate all of those manual and repetitive processes. Now, when you are looking to get to grips with workflow capacity in, in your firm and begin to improve it, your practice management approach should support that. It should account, as I said before, it should account for all of the work in your firm. It's critical, it's housed where it's visible to the entire team, and it should be in that centralized place so everyone can see who's working on what, what's due, what's not in, what's coming up. And this shouldn't just be for your client work. The biggest trap that firms fall into is just planning for client work. It leads to maxing out capacity, becoming overwhelmed and burning out. Proper planning also accounts for all of that practice work, all of that day-to-day -day stuff that goes into running your business. Now, we're about to start talking tools and I'm gonna bring on our presenters from our partners, Ignition, Dex, and, and Cloudstore, who you've just heard from. But first, Tish Bagwandine from InFinance Solutions, uh, a member of the QuickBooks Trainer, Trainer Rider Network, is gonna look at the practice management tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant. So when I talked about centralizing all of that work flowing across your team, the work tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant let you do just that, tracking your jobs, recording where you're spending your time, uh, and automating your workflows. But it also integrates with our app partners, Ignition for engagement letters, payments and more, and with Dex so that you can import client financial data into QuickBooks Online directly. And of course, as a cloud-based solution, it opens up possibilities with how you structure and staff your team. And uh, Chris from CloudStuff is gonna talk to that uh, a little bit later as well. So first, let's take a deeper look at some of the tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant. Tish, it's over to you. Thanks, Grant. Um, but before we take a deep dive into the actual tools itself, I think maybe it's important to understand some of the key benefits um, these tools are actually bringing to us. Um, and for me, we've spoken a lot about remote teams and offshoring, and personally, I do run my own offshore and remote team in Australia and other regions. And very often that means that we are working with the time difference. And so what becomes really important with me is getting that improved visibility on end to end, whether it's an internal admin task that my admin assistant is managing, or whether it's my accounting team and client work, I really want to focus on that visibility to get an understanding of where everything is at at a particular time. 
Um, what connects directly into this is the ability to bring in a level of automation. And when I talk about automation, it's not just having other products integrated into QuickBooks, it's having that automation within QuickBooks Online Accountant itself. So what the product suite actually brings to me is I have that ability to create repeating work on a frequency. So if you think about things like your bookkeeping tasks, for example, you know that the standard process that's going to be done in exactly the same way from month to month you don't have to now go and trigger this work manually within your file. You can set this up on a repeating frequency and have that automatically triggered for you. And then beneath that, what sits for me is actually just the standardization of workflows. I want to know that whether my team is offshore, whether they're sitting somewhere remotely in Australia, the bookkeeping work is happening exactly in the same way. So there's no risk of something falling through the cracks. So let's focus a little bit more on improved visibility. So how am I achieving that in, um, in QuickBooks? So looking at improved visibility, one of the things that I do have is um, the ability to have various layouts that I'm looking at in QuickBooks. I'm not just restricted to one view, I can find something that works for me. And then from that, I actually have the ability to drill down via either look at things at a project level or a task level. And what that actually helps me do is identify bottlenecks in processes. And again, when we talk processes, we're not just thinking about client work, we're actually looking at work that occurs internally within our firm. So here we have an example of the grid layout of work within my QuickBooks file. And you can see by the highlighted areas, there's a number of things that I can actually filter with this. So this grid layout, this grid layout here actually allows me to filter things by either project or a task level. So it really comes down to how much of detail you want to look at at a particular point in time. Viewing things at a project level helps me understand the status of a project at a particular point in time. And then drilling down to things on a task level actually helps me understand what are the specific tasks that are either complete, overdue, or not yet started. And looking at things in this way actually lets me identify where's that bottleneck. Um, if I have five tasks across clients that are repeating as overdue, it might be that there's a particular issue with the way the work is performed and that then need to drill into that work process to help me understand the detail behind that. An added benefit of using the work function within your QuickBooks file is you will note once you create work for a QuickBooks client, and that means a subscription that sits within your file, you automatically have visibility about on the number of outstanding transactions. So this is a task that automatically gets pulled into your file. It's not something that you have to manually create within your file. So this is just some of the benefits from the grid view. If the grid view is not something that works for you, you do have the option of looking at it at a list view. And this basically, again, you have the same filter options. You can view things either by task or project level. And you have two added columns here, so you can view things by date. You also have the ability to filter in and hone in on a particular period. So if you just want to look at what works currently on the go and work out what's overdue or where, what status that work is at, you have the ability to do that. Likewise, if you want to use the screen to plan forward for the next month to see what's coming up, you can filter to those specific dates. Lastly, we have the calendar view. We have the calendar view, and this is very summarized. So it's not giving you as much information as the first two views that we looked at, but really what this is also letting you hone in on is looking at a specific date and understanding how much of work is overdue within a particular period, or conversely, what has been completed within a period. And what it lets me do is compare the efficiencies from week to week. So in the previous week, maybe everything ran on time, all my work was completed, but in this week, I can see I have a number of things that's outstanding. And for me as a business owner, overall looking at my practice, what does this actually helping me do, do is analyze what's going wrong in this week. Is there a particular driving force behind why work is becoming overdue? Um, is it because clients are on leave and we can't communicate with them adequately? Is it because I have an internal staff shortage, maybe someone called in sick or a sudden resignation? So it's really helping me hone in and make those key decisions. So now we'll have a look at communication and how this gets streamlined. Um, so I'm sure everyone has that experience where you send a ton of emails to a client and you're always requesting the same information, whether it's bank statements, 
um, for your, your month end or end of year, um, and they just don't respond to you, or they do respond and it gets stuck into a bottleneck of emails, and somehow you just find yourself constantly trolling through emails. What the work function does within QuickBooks, it gives you access to what I call the client portal. So this means we now have the ability to communicate and request information directly from our QuickBooks file to our clients. And how this actually works is you actually create a request within your file directly to your clients. And this will then trigger off an email notification to your clients and let them know that they then need to log into QuickBooks to respond to this request accordingly. They have the ability to respond in writing to you, but if you requested specific information, like those bank statements or maybe lease contracts, whatever is important to that piece of work, they have the ability to actually upload this to the QuickBooks file. Now, this for me is a huge game changer because that means the information then becomes available in the cloud for this particular piece of work. So in the event that you do have that staff shortage or someone is calling in sick, you're not restricted to having that information on their desktop stuck in their emails, which is then bottlenecking your process. Anyone in the team now has direct access to this information. Having the ability to set due dates to clients' tasks really does keep clients accountable. You're telling them upfront what your expectation is, and they know if they pass that due date, they then have to be accountable for the work falling behind. And this is something that really helps me when a client rings in, has this expectation that we're gonna suddenly give them a two day turnaround on their tax return, but just submitted the information to us three hours ago. We can always pull up this task and say, we did set that expectation upfront. There is now an overlap or a breakdown in the timeline, and we need to relook at the project. So these are just little things within the file that are helping me gain that overall efficiency within my workflow. And lastly, let's take a look at our template. So if you're at the start of your process and you haven't really implemented something like automated workflows within your file, one of the great things within QuickBooks is that it does have several templates that are already built in for you. Now, looking at some of these templates, it might not cover the entire process within your form, but what's really good about this is you can come in and duplicate any templates and then tailor it to your form's needs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it can be a little bit daunting when you're at the start of your process trying to document everything that occurs either within a client process or your client onboarding, offboarding process. And my advice around here is really start mapping out the high level milestones within your process and then build in the detail. I think it's very easy to get tripped up and try to document every minutia of action that you're trying to do within your firm. But realistically think about what is essential for my team to know if I was sitting on the other side, if I read this process, can I then pick up this work independently and keep things ticking along? And if you can answer yes to that question, then I think your process will be sufficient to address everything within your firm. Um, here, have a real think. And again, when we're talking about building out that ecosystem of technology within our practice management, have a good idea of of how you want each piece of technology to integrate or interact within that ecosystem. For example, if you, you are using things like Ignition within your practice, you really want to map out your internal process to um, sort of identify, okay, this is the point where we send out the engagement letter and actually bring Ignition into that process to say, that's my starting point. I need to go to Ignition to actually set that, set that process in motion. Or if we're looking at the end where we need to go into billing clients, and I do get asked this question quite often, but then how do we know when to bill and how are we going to bill? That is something that you can actually bring in into your overall form process, where you're just writing a process to say, well, now you need to go and bill through Ignition, and you can actually leave a little bit of an instruction on how that's done. So if you have that completely new person that's coming within the form, they know exactly what is expected from them. Um, and to take us farther into how Ignition will interact into our overall practice management, I'd hand you over to Ethan. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Tish. That's great. Let me see if I can get this slide clicker working here. There we go. Um, awesome. That was a really great lead in. So thank you um, so much for taking us through all those different items within um, QBOA, Tish, and, and your um, recommendations just for putting process around those items. I think that that leads in beautifully to what I'm wanting to talk about today, which is um, what are the key problems that we are looking to solve 
um, as a part of your technology stack for your practice. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we interact with QuickBooks um, products as well. And then what we're seeing successful firms um, implement as part of their practice tech stacks as well. So a little bit of background, if this is the first time uh, you're seeing my face or seeing Ignition, uh, we're a, a company that was founded in Sydney, so a software company. Uh, we've grown to, to service almost 7,000 um, accounting and bookkeeping practices now uh, all over the world. And we really focus on enabling the advisor-client relationship by providing clarity over your engagement. So exactly what is the work that you're going to be completing for that client? What is the fee schedule attached to that work? And then providing you with those points of automation around invoicing and workflow, as Titch uh, touched on earlier. So just to touch on a couple of the key areas we want to drill into today, I really want to narrow in on late payments and receivables. This is, I, th I think I mentioned at the start of when we we're having our conversation with the panel, um, this is a really common issue that we're trying to address that we're seeing come up quite often um, across a lot of uh, advisors at the moment is this issue of, of collecting uh, their, their client payments on time and also dealing with debtor days in their firm. Um, further to that, we want to put an end to unbilled work. So work that you're completing for the client that you don't end up uh, recovering on because it was completed out of scope. Or as Tish mentioned, the parameters of that work has changed. Something's changed. The client hasn't got you the information in the right format on time and it's caused you to go above and beyond, um, but not, not necessarily charge for that, that change. Um, and then inefficient processes within your practice around workflow, around in client engagements as well. So um, just to uh, validate this, we surveyed almost 600 SME firms across Australia. And so SME being small, less than 30 staff uh, practices across Australia. And we found that on average, they were losing just under $104,000 a year in work that they were completing that was out of scope that they weren't charging their clients for. Um, this was quite a, a shocking result, uh, but it just proves that this is an issue that we need to address within our businesses is going above and beyond and completing this work, but not being able to bill for it. And um, this was this might seem a little bit high to you, but after speaking with um, and validating this with a number of different um, practice owners, I can tell you this number is, is real. Um, and it is something that we can address and we are tackling with Ignition. We believe a, a big part of this is due to inefficient processes within scoping and client onboarding. And you can see on the screen here, I've, I've given you a bit of an example of um, what this might look like, hopefully not exactly like this within your practice. Um, but you can see here, there's a, a mishmash of different steps when you're bringing on board a new client or you're re-engaging an existing client. And by re-engaging, I mean sitting down with them uh, for your year in review and talking about the, the work that you're going to complete over the next 12 months. What does that process actually look like for your business or is it very much ad hoc and sort of managed uh, off the cuff as well? So this is a, a very, very much a common um, process that we see within a lot of firms that, that we work with. Um, very mismatched. They're getting leads, client leads, new clients from referrals from their website all over the place, but there's no structured process to bring those clients through a journey where there's a clear scoping, there's a clear engagement, there's a clear communication of the price. Um, and then there's there's ongoing communication around that scope of work that will be completed. Um, and I think this ties exactly into to what Tish was sharing with us earlier, just around putting those parameters in place for your team around how they engage with your clients. If a client calls or contacts your team directly, there is a process then to go back and actually revisit what they were originally signed up for what they were engaged for and whether that piece of work falls under our current scope with the client or whether we need to go and send them a new engagement to get agreement to those services. So hopefully some of this is resonating with you. We think there is a better way uh, to tackle this and um, we think that way is getting properly engaged for any work that you're complete, you're completing for the client um, through an upfront proposal. And so this doesn't mean that we're encouraging you to bill for all of your work up front or move to a different way of billing a fixed fee billing model or something. We just mean communicating the scope of that work um, up front and, de and defining the terms of that work as well. So setting out the fee schedule, whether that be fixed or hourly for the work, 
um, being proactive and also remaining compliant. If you are familiar with the guidance that you need to comply with as a, as a tax agent, so APS 305 is a good example. The Tax Practitioners Board also recommend that we do uh, formally engage our clients each year or whenever the scope of that work changes. Um, this is critically important in today's day and age of um, you know, data breaches as well. Um, you know, God forbid that ever happened to, to any of you, but um, it's it's critical that we have an up-to-date engagement letter and T's and C's that are supporting our client agreements in the event of fee disputes, data breaches, anything like that, so that we are covered um, as practitioners. So moving forward, as, as I've said, uh, we really believe that this, this process around your engagements uh, leads, obviously it leads to more conversations with your clients, but there are more opportunities to then add value, more opportunities to um, set expectations with your clients. And again, if you are actually sitting down with your clients and, and making sure that you're um, clear about what you're billing for, you'll find that you are driving profit straight to your bottom line without necessarily needing to invest in more capability to do the work or find new work because you'll be billing for work that you're already doing, um, but you've just been doing it for free. So I wanted to highlight just how this works, how Ignition fits into your overall practice workflow. It's simple four steps you can see on screen. So we um, allow you to send an online proposal to your clients, uh, which includes those terms of engagements, the scope of work, the fee schedule, and actually gives your clients the ability to pay um, within that proposal itself um, or to put in their payment details rather. Um, Ignition will then automatically go and manage all of those collections and actually then create all of the invoices and reconcile them within QuickBooks Online. So we have the ability to... Um, to actually sync your client database. So you've got one single source of truth and changes that are made on either side. So from Ignition or from QuickBooks will be pushed through to the respective um, platform as well. So you're able to maintain a single source of truth, a single client database uh, where invoices are automatically created for that work. Payment is automatically collected within, within Ignition. And because we've been able to create those invoices within QuickBooks Online, we can automatic, automatically reconcile those as well. After your proposal has been accepted, there's a whole raft of things you can do um, uh, after the client signs up, and those would be triggering certain tasks. Um, perhaps it's you know creating a link to a, a portal that's automatically sent to the client. Perhaps it's triggering some specific onboarding tasks, um, like Tish was demonstrating earlier within the template gallery within um, QBOA. You'll have your certain uh, tasks, your quarterly best, that all the tasks that you need to complete for that you can marry those up with the actual services that are in your Ignition proposal as well. So if I'm engaging my client for uh, for a quarterly BAS, I can make sure that that corresponding template is included in my Ignition proposal, which then flows through to for that work to be completed. Um, again, sort of creating that accountability and visibility across that whole client lifecycle. Um, this looks a little blurry on my screen, but hopefully you can make uh, make this out. I'll, I'll explain it to you. Uh, what we've found a lot of successful firms doing is presenting packages, uh, so different levels of price or tiers of service to their clients. And we've had this feature in market for about 18 months now, and we're finding that many, many firms are starting to take this approach leading into the new financial year, where they're actually going to the extent of um, creating uh, fixed packages uh, for each of their clients and presenting up to three tiers of service. Now, now what this might do for you is, and you, you might be thinking, oh, this is not relevant for me. The reason why it is relevant is because it gives you a platform to easily explain the difference between one price point and another and the value of each of those services that you're providing the client. So if you have a client and you're pitching a certain package, say, oh, it's a little bit more than what I'm wanting to spend. Okay, that's great. Well, we can pull these services out and drop you back to our middle tier for now until you're ready to grow into these new services. So it just gives you a framework to have some really effective conversations with your clients around what you're charging them and why. Uh, what I mentioned earlier as well is just the ability to get paid automatically. And uh, what we facilitate at Ignition is either credit card or direct debit payments from your clients. And they can actually put in those payment details at the point of signing your proposal. So if the light bulbs are going off for you, this means that no work and no invoices, nothing's going to be created within QuickBooks without a signed set of terms, agreement to a fee schedule and client payment details. So you can see what I mean where we're, we're finding firms that are, have got um, you know, an issue with receivables, they've got debtor problems, they've got cash flow problems because they're taking too long to get paid. This is a great way of bringing that process in, automating it, 
making sure that nothing's falling through the cracks uh, as well. I've talked a little bit about client agreements. We have um, a whole raft of templates there that you can utilize uh, to actually automate the creation of your engagement letters as well. So if you're part of a professional body um, like Chartered Accountants or CPA or any of the, uh, the bodies that operate here, we have their integrated, um, most recent up-to-date terms of engagement that are automatically created for you as part of that. And as Tish mentioned, this can be built into your internal processes so that anyone within your team, even a junior staff member can jump in, uh, select the client that's synced from QuickBooks, select the relevant engagement letter, select the, the template for the, um, the services that you're going to engage them for, and you'll have a draft proposal there ready for review in two to three minutes. So it's super powerful stuff. Um, I've talked enough about billing. I did want to talk a little bit about how we fit into this life cycle. So I've explained this, but here's a visual for you, for those who, who learn visually. Um, again, sort of a five-step uh, process. You can see that your services, the price for your services and the payments is, is um, captured within Ignition, but then also your workflow and services are at the same time are triggered through QuickBooks Online. And you can see that, uh, that step there within step three and four, where there's that beautiful sync that happens um, between the two systems and allows you to um, not only sync all the client information, but all the invoicing and everything that pertains to that uh, that client group. So then at the end of the day, you're able to report on all of your cash flow, your revenue, your pipeline, all of those metrics through Ignition and your recoverability, your efficiency, your productivity, all the jobs and tasks to be done um, through QuickBooks. It takes around one to two minutes uh, to get started with the integration as well. So for those who currently use Ignition and you might not have connected with, with QBO, if you go to the app straw within the product, it literally takes around one to two minutes. You connect the file, you set up some default tax rates and you're away. And you can actually start to then define all of the invoice templates that you're then utilizing as part of that integration as well. So um, I would highly encourage you if you are, are currently uh, using Edition, which I'd assume some of you on the call would be, please go and explore this integration because uh, we have thousands of pro advisors who are taking advantage of this and um, taking advantage of it to their, to their success. So I wanted to make the point that we also have um, a whole lot of support available for you. So expert training and support, access to, to exclusive webinars and events, a certification program, um, a Facebook community, a dedicated account manager on certain plans as well. Um, we have the support there to, to help you get up and running before uh, 30 June for your new um, financial year engagements as well. And we also have experts who know this integration with QuickBooks like the back of their hand and they can help construct what we call a process map for you, uh, which actually maps out all of these workflows within your firm and helps you to set it all up uh, alongside the, the team at, at, uh, at QuickBooks. So look, that's um, that's me. I believe I'm handing over to my fellow Queenslander, Glenn. Um, Glenn, I will, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Ethan. Um, yep, the other Queenslander in a jumper, so a um, bit ironic there, but um, appreciate the, the session. Um, all right, so what I'm going to be running through today, I guess, is the um, practice management um, sort of side of things within Dex Prepare. Now, I know a lot of um, I guess people out there perhaps don't actually think about practice management when we're actually thinking um, about Dex, but what we ended up releasing um, probably towards the beginning of last year, it would have been, is a feature within um, Dex Prepare called Practice Insights. Now, essentially what Practice Insights is going to enable accounting and bookkeeping firms, and we have like thousands of bookkeeping firms obviously out there using our solutions, it's actually going to start providing some of the insights into what I spoke about um, at, in the intro session. You know, we all know Dex Prepare, it's really around that sort of invoice, that receipt capture, digitizing data, making sure that we've got all those automations in place to actually get the information into QuickBooks um, online. So what this is, solution is really going to be about is showcasing where the opportunities are in terms of that bookkeeping data. Now, you know, we've seen with obviously the, the QuickBooks practice management sort of side of things, you know, all of the tools there that you know gives you that ability to sort of monitor the progress and the performance of engagements. Ethan's obviously taken us through how to ensure that your clients you know are properly engaged, all the scope of works are outlined, etc. At Dex, what we're going to be actually looking at is actually what's happening in that day-to-day -day work, what's actually happening with that data, um, and where staff actually need to be staff in the bookkeeping firm need to be looking at in terms of where their clients um, are actually at. So I'm going to click through to the, the next slide here. And just a, a quick quote I've got up on screen there. 
Um, I'll read it out. You can have data without information, but you cannot have information without data. Um, so if you sort of stopped and have a think about that for a second, it really sort of highlights that we can have all of the data flowing through into these different systems, but unless we're actually able to analyze them and understand them and actually make decisions of them, they're of no use to us. This is really the premise behind what our practice insight solution um, is, is going to bring. Um, so in terms of why is practice level data um, important, some of the steps, I'll let you sort of read those and I'll sort of talk through a few different points there. It gives us the ability to sort of dive deeper into the data, um, identify where there's actually room for improvement. You know, if a client or team member, you know, is taking longer um, than expected to complete tasks, um, we're going to give you that visibility to be able to see and suggest where automation can actually help in that process. Um, I will take you through some examples um, a little bit later of where we actually showcase some of these particular points within there. It's really about that richer insight and empowering sort of staff to add more, more value. You know, we talk a big part of automation. I'm going to show you where the deficiencies are that DEX will actually identify as to where the opportunities actually lie. When we sort of talk about practice insights, you know, it's really about providing everyone with that right level of understanding, sort of to be able to take the initiative to improve their workflow, you know, from making that decisions at the practice level to even some things like, you know, the minor workload improvements as well. You'll be able to make key decisions, you know, based upon the right data that's actually in the system. What we're also going to be able to do as well is benchmark clients against each other based upon their, their efficiency index prepare. Um, it's also not just about clients. We're also going to be able to look across different suppliers, you know, as well. And we'll get into sort of showing you some examples of that. What this is really going to enable, um, you know, staff within the practice to be able to do, really allocate time more effectively, you know, and set your, um, set your team up to have those better discussions with your clients. Or, you know, if you are doing a lot of the processing yourself, um, be able to look at what opportunities do exist as to how we can actually automate that process you know, a lot more. And um, when we sort of come back and start thinking about you know, the practice management side of things, it's really about trying to minimize a lot of those write-offs you know, that we all wear. Um, you know, jobs are taking longer than perhaps what they should be. Let's look at the opportunities to where we can actually make the improvements um, going forward. So that sort of brings me to, to I guess, a little bit of a, a screenshot you can see on the screen there of our practice insight solution. So, what this is going to do, and this is really a phase one for us, um, we are sort of working on some enhancements on this at, at the moment. As I said, this has been out for probably about 18 months um, or so now, where we've essentially got five different metrics on the screen there, which we're able to delve into a lot more detail um, underlying that particular data. So I am going to jump into all of those different widgets um, in a little bit, but essentially what this dashboard is going to be able to, to provide us with is that ability to drill down into the detail of it. It's going to show us how we can actually sort of drive you know, that productivity going forward, giving us really a clear view of the jobs um, that need to be done. As I mentioned before, benchmarking efficiency. That's obviously a big one. We can see what clients you know, may need more attention, what clients have potentially grown a lot more than what they were last year. Where are we actually devoting a lot of our resources in terms of the, the processing in the system? Um, you know, if we look at what are the opportunities there to, to optimise capacity, you know, providing all users with the right level of understanding, you know, to take that initiative and improve their workflows, you know, using Dex Prepare. Um, I think it's, yeah, the most important position is, you know, by start making these decisions, okay? We've got to have the data, we've got to have the information there to actually understand where we can make the improvements. This is really primarily about what this tool um, is about. Um, used quite heavily from a lot of partners within the firms as well, because it does give you that big picture um, overview, obviously, as to, to what's happening um, with the practice. Um, it gives you that, I, I guess, a way of being able to digest the information, you know, in, in a graphical form. You know, I think a lot of these sort of widgets and that are cropping up more and more in, in software as we go, um, really gives us some sort of practical visual insights to understand what's going on. All right. What I'm going to do then, we'll take a look at some different items um, within here. So the first widget that I've actually drilled down into here um, is the items to action um, widget. So what we're actually looking at, and hopefully you can sort of see that on the screen there, I'll start off with the, the one in the top left-hand corner. And the first point is really around that sort of work prioritisation. We can see there at a glance, what are those, my five top clients where there's actually work we need to review? Now you can see hopefully on that, that screenshot there, there's 25 items to review on Danny's deli delivery, um, et cetera. 
So that's immediately telling me that I've got documents in the Dex Prepare inbox that someone needs to go into action. Why is these items still sitting in review? Why aren't they being published through to you know, QuickBooks, et cetera? Um, that's going to, I guess, be able to provide those insights as to which clients, where I need to actually focus on my work. Across the, into the, the top right-hand corner there that we've got is looking at, um, I guess, a filter there. I'll run through the importance of this filter in there because whilst you know, filters you know, probably don't get a lot of use, there are some really key points within there. What we can actually do is allocate your particular clients to different staff members. So you can see in that top right-hand corner there, I've got managed by um, John Accountant within there. What that's going to enable us to do is benchmark against not only our staff, but also the different clients um, that we've seen on the previous screen. If we have multiple offices, we work can actually benchmark across how are those different offices performing? And probably one of the most key aspects of this filter in there as well is you might have a lot of different services that you offer clients running through Dex Prepare, whether you're doing the work or whether your client's actually doing the work. What we're able to look at here is whether the data is essentially managed by the practice or it's managed by the client. So things that are going to be managed by the client, for instance, are going to have obviously different criteria as to how we're going to work on it versus something that we're managing internally. If we're managing it internally at that practice level, um, why hasn't the staff, I guess, reviewed that transaction? Why hasn't it been pushed through um, the QuickBooks? We can also look at the bookkeeping frequency in there as well. Is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Is it weekly? What is the actual time period around doing those transactions? And some of those will actually flow into some of the, um, I guess, the different widgets I'm going to show you um, in, in a minute as well. So a lot of this is just really about understanding where the work's at, being able to understand who needs to do what and getting the right metrics um, across the, the staff as to what needs to be done in the right here and now. What are the jobs that actually need to be done? We'll jump over and have a look at some of the items um, submitted. So what the items submitted is really about, it's actually giving us some metrics around what that client engagement looks like. How are they actually using um, the application. Are they even using the application? So bottom left-hand corner that we're looking at there, who are the lowest submitters? So we can see there that we've got, you know, two clients there that have submitted 100% less than what they did in the comparative period and such. Why is that the case? Do we need to actually reach out to them to offer more assistance? You know, you know could be just, hey, they're away on holidays or something like that, but it could be a, an example of they may be experiencing some financial distress. They may need help with their bookkeeping. Um, et cetera. So being able to pull those insights out um, and make those decisions on that. If we start looking at it then at some of the submissions um, within here, how are some of the, the clients actually submitting data into the system? So you can see we're going to track as to what is the rolling average, um, things like you know whether it's the same time last year, you know, are they actually submitting a lot more um, invoices than what they were in a comparative period. Like, is that impacting our staffing levels? Do we need to actually, you know, add more resources to actually deal with the level of data that's sort of coming into the, the system? If we look at things like the submission method, how are staff actually submitting or even clients submitting data into the system? Now, there's a lot more different ways that are efficient than others. Obviously, things like email in, for instance, is a really good indicator of firms that are really automating that process. And, the, the good firms that we see out there, they're the ones that have got you know, rules set up. When an email comes in from a supplier, it automatically gets forward into DEX. DEX will process and extract it and then publishing it straight across in the QuickBooks online. Okay. Are we you know, manually uploading PDFs? That's a, a good indicator of maybe it's a bit um, less of an efficient way of actually getting some data into the system as well. So all of these sort of metrics we can start pulling out. Again, I'm looking at this at the practice level we can actually start drilling down into each individual client insight. If I look at some of the activity level, again, this is gonna show you some examples um, of the client activity. So something like the submission delay, I spoke about this at the, the very beginning. We've got an invoice that has been sent, it's gone um, you know, into the, the CFO's drawer, for instance, it sat there for two weeks, for instance, it hasn't actually been entered into the system. How are we gonna be able to make those decisions on that data when it's not kept up to date. And you can see a metric there off to the right-hand side where I'm looking at, say, my bookkeeping frequency there. The real client to pull out in this example is the glass half full bakery. We're doing weekly um, bookkeeping for this particular client, but the submission delay on that is actually 18 days. 
you know, you got to beg the question there, how are you ever going to be able to do weekly bookkeeping when the invoice is not getting into the system until 18 days after it was actually issued? There is an immediate problem there that would need to be addressed. These are the type of metrics that we'll actually pull out and be able to highlight that to you to go back to that client and understand what their process is. And let's look at ways that we can actually improve it to get data um, into the system. All right, the biggest one for me, um, and this is really touching on automation now in all of these metrics that I've just been through, supplier rules is by far and away the biggest one that I wanna to touch on. This is really where the automation comes into play. So off to the right-hand side, we can see there's a, a bit of a chart there called supplier rules by client. What this is showing me in the example here, I've got 11 that have been auto-categorized. Um, so you can sort of see that light green and you've got in the dark green, not impacted by rules. So what that's essentially meaning is all of those transactions or all of those documents that have come into the system, there are no supplier rules being applied to that. So our supplier rules are really about ensuring which account does it need to go to in QuickBooks, potentially what tax rate, um, does it need to get allocated to a class, et cetera. What needs to actually happen with that data that comes into the system? This is where we can start automating things. So for every single supplier, let's say we get from Bunnings, it automatically goes to our cost of goods sold um, account. We can even get to the stage where we auto publish that on. So Dex really just starts becoming a processing engine to actually get data um, into QuickBooks. We can then in the, the bottom left-hand corner there, start tracking this over time. So you can see that's looking at it via month there. There's also that sort of red dotted line, which is looking at an automation trend. So this is showing you as you start adding more supplier rules into this process, how the automation is actually increasing, you know, across your firm, across your client. Okay. This is really where you know a lot of our clients out there, our partners, um, that have really adopted these rules um, to their fullest are seeing a lot of automation through the practice. Data comes in, it gets processed, it gets put straight into QuickBooks Online without anyone need, needing to touch anything um, in a lot of instances. Um, bottom right-hand corner there as well, last point that I actually want to make, hopefully you can sort of see that there, it's a little bit blurry for, for me also, but what this is actually looking at there, you can see the supplier is across Amazon. Um, that's across five different clients. So I've got five different clients that have actually purchased transactions from Amazon. Three of those are set to auto categorization, two of them are not. Are we able to apply those same rules for Amazon across those bottom two clients there to actually bring about that automation? So when I said at the start, we're not just looking at clients, we're also looking at the suppliers as well as to how we can actually leverage what's happening in one client's file into another client's file. Um, this is sort of really about pulling out that key information um, to make your practice as efficient as possible. Um, yes, we can go through and cash code um, items, but we need to make sure that we actually get supporting documentation against the transaction, make it automated as possible. Um, Dex Prepare is obviously a key solution in helping you in that process. Um, so thanks for your time. If anyone wants, uh, you know, I guess an in-house demonstration as such, um, you can drop me an email there. So glenn.castle.dex.com. Otherwise you can jump onto our website, check out the videos um, and yeah, we'll reach out to you if you have any more questions. So with that being said, I might hand over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, Glenn. Have you got me? Here we are. Okay, so um, it's great to be here. And thanks again for inviting me on. I'm taking a bit of a different tangent than, than these guys, but relative to the content, you know, clearly um, cloud has um, enabled a lot of businesses um, drive their productivity. And one of the things I want to turn attention to today um, is really to start thinking about, you know, taking that a step further um, and to think about that in the context of, Excuse me, guys. Think about that in the context of um, embracing some new thinking around, um, you know, taking cloud a step further to think about cloud-based teams. Um, the technology that we use has really helped drive um, behaviors, drive productivity within your businesses. Um, and, you know, often we, we think about organizations um, capitalizing on remote teams and outsourcing as a, as a huge opportunity to grow their businesses. Um, but often, you know, those firms that don't um, are missing out. And one thing I want to talk about today is really to look at some insights into what makes outsourcing successful um, for those firms. You know, many of you today are already outsourcing. 
Um, equally, you know, some of the things that maybe you'd like to start to think about when it comes to outsourcing, having a think about what's important, um, things to start to question uh, when you're looking at outsourcing as an opportunity. One thing in terms of, uh, I guess, a killer stat, and this statistic was from Business Wire um, survey that was, that was conducted a couple of years ago. Those practices who already outsource are actually driving higher profitability and productivity by around 80% of these firms are driving more productivity because of using outsourcing. And when we think about today, and we, we touched on this earlier with Grant as well, Australia is in the middle of, you know, what is, you know, I hate to say unprecedented, but it's certainly a very challenging labor market right now to hire in. Um, I've been speaking with a lot of accounting firms over the past couple of months and availability of talent is coming up front and center, um, the toughest um, business challenge that most organizations are going through today. Often, you know, to find staff in market, the wages are growing. Um, it is making it very difficult and very um, challenging from a cost perspective to hire onshore. And often people are now starting to look onshore to fulfill um, some of these hiring requirements as well. But it's not just about, you know, it's not just about the avail availability of talent over here. It's actually about the attractiveness of talent overseas as well. Now, cloud staff, we do um, typically work out of the Philippines market or originally. Uh, we also operate out of India as well. Um, and we partner with around about uh, 600 companies here in Australia. Um, and we certainly work very closely with these organizations in making outsourcing successful for them. And we also conducted a fair bit of research um, and we conducted some research recently through Core Data. And what we wanted to do was uncover what's really making, uh, what's really making outsourcing tick for these companies and what they value the most. Um, but first and foremost, finding out who is outsourcing was, was the first point uh, that we looked at. And in terms of uh, the market today, already one in three of us nearly uh, on probably on this call today are outsourcing uh, roles to other firms. So this is a maturing opportunity, um, but it's, it's equally a very immature opportunity as well. There's a lot of headroom, a, a lot more companies are looking to outsource uh, their positions, um, and that is accelerating Particularly over the last couple of years, we're seeing some really big tailwinds in this market um, as firms start to look for talent a bit beyond their borders here in Australia. And often we think about cost saving as the most important thing, but, but, but equally it's not always about cost. I mean, yes, of course, cost is important, um, but more time servicing existing clients and reducing workloads on our, on our staff. Um, and the second point is something which comes up time and time again right now. Um, yeah, client service, of course, uh, we need to invest in, but protecting and making sure that the teams we've got um, are not unduly suffering from heavy workload has really been a bit of a lever for a lot of firms to look at ways to mitigate that um, by looking at different ways they can resource their teams. Equally, quality of support as well. You know, what... what people find and need um, in terms of their requirements um, is quality and accounting expertise, um, you know, partnering with organizations who really get what they're looking for, who really understand their challenges, can supply the talent and supply the tools and technology as well that are going to make them highly successful when they're looking to outsource their organization's needs. So in terms of those firms who already outsource um, 53% of those um, who outsource already want to increase their reliance on outsourcing. So what this tells us is that it's working, it's effective, and they want to do more of it. And of course, when we think about the last three years, I guess for many of us, it's been the world's greatest training exercise in how to manage teams remotely. Um, many of us, of course, hadn't managed people remotely pre-pandemic, um, we became really good at it during the pandemic. Um, and of course, work from home for many of us is here to stay. Um, people are working from home on this call today. Um, and this is something which um, is, is not going to change in the short term. And of course, you know, when you're looking at partners, make sure that they've got the ability um, to, to, to offer flexibility. Many of our customers love to have staff work from office equally. Many of them are very happy to have staff work from home as well. And when we do work from home, 
um, with our work from home products, um, ensuring that they've got the um, tech capability um, to deliver the tasks and do do great work is really important. And, you know, at the very extreme end, we're now looking at solar panels on roofs for these staff who are working from home um, to make them even more efficient um, and effective and, and make them more sustainable for our customers as well and even more sustainable for the environment too. And looking at the roles that can be outsourced, clearly you know, on the call today, accounting and, and bookkeeping um, roles have been around for quite a while. But when you start to think about the other positions that um, you can outsource, there, there are 25 key accounting roles that can be outsourced really effectively. And these roles are you know, naturally positions that can be done um, pretty much remotely from anywhere using the cloud tech stacks that people are using today. So what do we need to consider when choosing the right partner? Well, I think first and foremost, um, making sure that the partners that you're looking at can cover your time zones. Uh, we're speaking today to firms here in Australia and New Zealand, making sure that firms clearly can cover your business operating hours is going to be a prerequisite for you. Um, make sure that they can do this. Um, but when it comes down to talent, this is where it's at. Asking them about, you know, how, how they're hiring, what is their recruitment and hiring process? How can they take your requirements and find the very best candidate that's a great fit for you, for your business and for your positions? Do they offer training? Are they going to make sure that the candidates are going to be prepared and ready when they hit the deck um, and start within your businesses? And that's from a skills perspective. Equally, from a technology perspective, uh, making sure that they can use QuickBooks, that they're ready to go uh, on the first day of their engagement with you as an organization. Data security. Um, increasingly, data and data security is coming up um, as a massive priority uh, for every company, as it should be. Do your homework, speak to the organizations and make sure uh, that they've got your best interests at heart. Um, and that they've got processes in place um, to make sure you've got the best data security, uh, you're protecting, your customers are protected as well. Culture. You know, it's about the people. Um, when you look to outsource, um, today it's really about relationships. And the very best firms who manage their people remotely onshore, um, if they're applying the same fundamentals offshore, they're going to get the very best results. So clearly, culture, um, sharing, uh, you know, working with a partner who shares your goals and philosophy is going to be vital to long-term success for you uh, and your organization. Um, effective communication, making sure that you communicate with um, the staff as you would any staff on shore, but equally working with a partner who can look after you, uh, make sure that your needs and requirements are met. Um, ideally, you want to be managing, uh, working with a, someone looking after your account onshore um, and taking care of every need that you have as an organization. Um, in terms of infrastructure and technology, um, it's when the people and technology come together um, that really great outcomes happen through outsourcing. So make sure that they've got the right tools to help you manage the staff really effectively and efficiently. Make sure that they've... Um, the, 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 the training and the onboarding um, and all of the necessary tools and requirements are there for you to be really successful. In terms of um, credibility, are they an experienced provider? Uh, you need to do your homework, speak to um, other customers um, of these providers and make sure you're comfortable and satisfied that they're going to be a good fit for your business. And finally, visit the facilities. If you can, spend the time to go and do the research spend the time to pop into the Philippines or pop into India um, to go and see what it might look like for your organization as well. Failing that, look for testimonials and make sure that you can do some video tours um, and speak with the teams to make sure that you're comfortable as well. So really in conclusion, um, it's time to think about accessing a talent pool beyond Australia. So, you know, times, times to think about this. So when your team are stretched, um, if you need a better work-life balance or if, if you're looking to reduce your costs or ramp up capacity, outsourcing could be a very good solution for you. So um, on that note, I'm going to pass over uh, back to Grant um, and thank you for your time.
Grant, I think you're muted there, mate. Oh, so I am, rookie mistake. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, we do have a little poll uh, running. Um, we've been running them through the session. Uh, if you want a member of Ignition, of Dex, or from Cloud Stuff to get in contact with you uh, and discuss your needs, um, jump in and hit that poll up uh, and leave your details there. Um, we'll also have contact details for everyone out in that email um, that comes to you with a copy of today's recording. So, moving on. The tools that Tish took you through uh, at the start of the webinar are all of those practice management tools in QuickBooks Online Accountant. Um, how do you get your hands on those? Everything that you saw today presented by Tish is available right now as a benefit of the QuickBooks Pro Advisor program. If you're new to QuickBooks, when you sign up for QuickBooks Online Accountant, which is free to sign up for, you automatically become a member of the Pro Advisor program and you get access to a range of tools, uh, including those ones that Tish talked about today along with training uh, and other benefits, so uh, like di uh, discounts from our partners like Ignition. It also includes access to QuickBooks Tax to manage those VAS and tax lodgements, uh, unlimited access to QuickBooks Payroll to pay your team, your firm, uh, as well as MailChimp, uh, Intuit MailChimp to market your business, uh, exclusive discounts and a whole heap more. The ProAdvisor program is a tiered program, so the more training that you do and the more clients that you work with using QuickBooks Online, the more benefits you unlock. So if you want to learn more, you can head to intuit.me uh, forward slash ProPerks. It's that address on your screen there. Uh, or you can jump into QuickBooks Online Accountant and click Pro Advisor, then Benefits in the left-hand navigation. And you'll see everything that you're entitled to. Um, we will have that link to you in an email uh, with the recording of today's session though. But look at those tools, uh, as well as some more tips on streamlining your processes. Make sure you download our latest ebook as well. It goes into a lot more depth on how you can take a proactive approach to working with your clients, uh, how to make sure that your team is properly equipped, uh, as well as having the right tools in place can make end of financial year easier. It also includes a link to our updated end of financial year checklist, uh, and you can grab it from that QR code on screen or at intuit.me forward slash EOFY hub. Uh, again, we'll have a, a link to it in the follow-up email that we send out with the recording of today's session. All right, let's uh, jump in. We've got a few minutes left, so we'll uh, get through a few questions. If you do have some questions, jump into the Slido panel. It's in the bottom right of your screen there. Uh, make a question in for the team uh, and we'll answer them on the call. So I'll invite everyone to just come off mute now and we'll jump into some Q&A. The first question uh, I think is for you, Ethan. It's uh, someone talking about some better days and I know you mentioned that people are seeing uh, an average of about 50 data days uh, at the moment, but, but they mentioned that they're seeing a much higher uh, instance of that. Is that something uh, that you've been seeing um, with other advisors you're working with? And is it something related to the broader economic conditions that we're facing at the moment, inflation, et cetera? Um, or is this perhaps something unique to them? And, and I guess importantly, um, how are the advisors that you're working with working to actually decrease data days? Yeah, good question, big question. Um, do my best to answer it. I, I think the, um, the in, that industry-wide survey was 53 days, uh, and I think something like 20 or just under 20 days in, in WIP, uh, so over 70 days in terms of lockup um, overall. That's actually pre what we're seeing firms when they implement Ignition, the, the debt has often dropped to either within terms nothing or negative, meaning that they're actually operating in like they've, they've got more cash in the bank than the work that they're completing because they're getting paid up and an agreement up front. Um, but 100%, I think it's it's definitely a sign of the economic times. But I also think it's, I mean, um, I certainly know when there's a bill sitting on my desk, uh, particularly an invoice, you know, it's it's very far down on the, the list of things to do. Um, and most suppliers now that we're engaging with are mandating payment upfront for their services. It's just the way of life. Um, you'd be on direct debit agreements with most of your, your, your utility providers. You would be paying upfront for, um, you know, if you've got tradies coming to your house, they're not, they're not often leaving without uh, taking payment as well. So I think it's something that's um, maybe eventuated because of the close nature of the relationships we have with clients that we just are happy to leave it and happy to let them pay. And perhaps you know that the client's um, you know, that they've got a cash flow pinch as well. So you, you feel bad asking them to pay their invoices and so on. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, put your own um, life vest on first so that you can continue to be around to help your clients as well. I, I think that the successful firms 
at least the ones that are um you know uh, moving on these processes are the ones that have got the cash flow to invest back into their businesses to continue helping their clients so yeah absolutely um you know we've seen a lot higher than 53 um in some instances we've seen firms with you know over six hundred thousand dollars in in receivables in in outstanding fees um which you know they were able to implement ignition and put their clients on payment plans and collect all of those in time uh, but yeah it's certainly a an issue across the industry so hopefully that answers your question i'm happy to share more of those links to the surveys and stuff following the session as well if, if that's of interest Brilliant. thanks ethan uh tish i think one for you so when you were talking about the the client portal um, and setting up reminders for your team um we had a question about um can you actually send reminders for tasks to clients and i think you can do this through the client access tab in quickbooks online accountants so for user in a firm has access to uh, the client that a project's been created for, they should be able to view and, and edit the tasks under that project and send reminders to a client, right? From a team perspective, yes. But in order to actually push out that client request, because the client doesn't have the capacity to automatically send off that email for a specific task, that's something that still has to be triggered by the person working within the project. Great, thanks Tish. Uh, Chris, one, one for you. Um, so an advisor has clients, as, as many do, um, on different accounting platforms, um, different accounting solutions. So do you have arrangements with an outsourced team member that can work across multiple platforms when uh, in an outsourced arrangement? Yeah, often, I mean, we try and match the requirements for the role very specifically to the candidate. So if there is a requirement from a, a practice who are looking for someone with multiple skill sets who've worked across multiple platforms, that's a good place for us to start. So we would we'll endeavour to find those people um, and present those candidates for interview. Equally, if there's a specific tool requirement that they have that they would like the candidate to have, and we can train that internally, we do have our own training academy here, we will make sure that person's trained up so that they're ready to go um, on day one of that of that engagement with the customer. So two options. We can find the candidate with the skills. If we can't find the candidate with the skills that are a good match, we'll teach them. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Glenn, one for you. This was on classes and supplier rule automations. And the question was, um, can you change those rules at a later date so that you're recategorizing uh, into a new category? Uh, and are you actually able to automate moving things out of uh, past items that may have been categorized into an older category into a new one? Yeah, um, good question. So we can um, essentially, hopefully I'm on screen it. Yep. Um, we can essentially change um, it after the fact. That will then apply for, I guess, any new documents that then get added into the system. So we'll sort of do the processing and the application of the rules as the documents get added. Um, in terms of, I guess, making sort of changes to things that have already happened, um, if they're sitting in decks prepared, yes, we can go through and, and change them. That would be on an individual basis rather than the supplier basis. If there's things that are obviously already in QuickBooks, um, that would obviously need to be changed um, in QuickBooks as such. But yes, we can change things indexed um, for more sort of new documents added going forward. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, that seems to be the end of the questions, unless anyone on the call has a last minute one. If you want to jump in, I'll give you a couple of seconds just to jump into the slider panel in the bottom of your screen there and whack that question in. But uh, if not, we may close up. So, no, I think we've been pretty thorough in what we've covered today. So uh, with that, um, I'll just Thank everyone for their time uh, in preparing and presenting today. Thank you so much, Tish, Ethan, Glenn, Chris, for all of your time and work. Uh, to everyone who's joined us on the call today, thank you for your time as well. We will have that uh, copy of the recording out to you. We will have links to find out more about uh, the solutions from Ignition, Dext, uh, and Cloud Stuff, as well as QuickBooks Online Accountant and the Workflow uh, Tools and Practice Management Solutions in there, uh, as well as a link to that ebook that I mentioned. So. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks to the team behind the scenes and we'll see you for our next webinar very soon. Thank you.